All right. So welcome to containers throughout your environment. Can, uh, can I get a quick show of hands? How many people here have used a container? Use something like Docker, Rocket, et cetera, LXD, Switch Root Jails, who's used FreeBSD cool stuff? Nah. Cool. So it seems like there, there's definitely a mix of experience here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about, give you a roadmap of so where we're going to go and what you might learn in the next 30, 40 minutes. Um, and I just hope to sort of start a conversation um, and talk a little bit about why containers are so excited, why we DigitalOcean are excited about them, how we hope other folks are using them, and what we see sort of their best uses as. Um, and then we'll sort of talk about how that relates to the PHP community, um, and we'll show some cool ideas and use cases for containers, and um, where you can use them, where you can't use them. So, uh, shiny containers, Docker, woo! Uh, that's actually not my bias. Um, Docker has definitely popped on the scene and grown exponentially over the last sort of two years. Um, I think Docker is very exciting for some reasons, but it's definitely not the answer to everything. So it could be a hammer, but it is not the hammer for every nail, and it is definitely not the hammer for some of the screws that we as developers have. Um, I think that's an important sort of caveat to keep in mind, um, in that whatever we do, we shouldn't try to think that it is the answer for everything. Um, there are some things that definitely make Docker as a technology and containers different from pre-existing technologies. Um, and we'll talk a little about why Docker is special. Um, but um, keep that in mind that, it, that you have to keep, you take, a, take a block of salt with, um, with some of its advantages. So what is an application container? And when we talk about containers most of the time, we actually imply the application part of that. Um, and what we really use and what Docker's become instrumental in demonstrating its use for is how to deploy applications in a container. So what does this mean? Um, the, the, the definition I'm going to use, just so that we're on the same sort of page, um, we have sort of the same background to talk about this, is that a container is a portable, self-sufficient unit that can be manipulated using standard operations and run across platforms. So each of these different aspects means different it has different implica implications for containers and offers, in some cases, constraints on how the containers can be used and where they're appropriate to be used. So I'm going to use uh, two analogies throughout the course of this talk to really talk about Docker and why it's special, or containers and why they're special. Um, and the first one is, the one that's classic, is uh, shipping containers. Um, and besides, I get to show cool pictures of lots of shipping containers in different ways and forms. So there'll be lots of pictures of, of those containers. Um, but the analogy is actually really important to think about. So historically, a shipping container was instrumental in the technology of transportation because it took odd, various goods and uh, objects that you wanted to transport across the globe and made and offered a uniform interface and way to move those goods. So as before, you had to use, uh, use different things for barrels of oil, tomatoes, computers, iPhones. A shipping container is actually a standard inter interface. Um, and it's actually interesting. You've seen development in shipping containers over the last 50 years, both in the types of things that you can put into those containers and, and sort of how you can transport those containers themselves. So for example, you've recently, or fairly recently in the history of transportation, seen refrigerated containers, um, containers um, different, uh, definitely different sizes and types. Um, and they definitely expanded the use cases where you can use containers, but the standard interface and the ways of interacting with those containers stayed the same. And that's an important sort of uh, part of the analogy to, to take from it. So let's, um, let's talk about each of these different characteristics. So portable, so not just on ships, trains, intermodal ways of transporting containers. Um, a, in, in the digital world, in the software world, um, when we say portable, what we actually mean is that you can transport these containers around. And 
Docker as an example, which I'll use throughout this talk because it is very easy to use and it's easy to get into. Docker is very portable for a couple different ways. The way that it breaks down containers is actually into different levels. So very, <clears throat> very similar to what Git does for code and content on a file system, Git does for the file system as a whole. So it actually offers append-only layers to a file system um, through a copy on write mechanism so that it's easy to transport um, different levels of these containers around. And you can actually stack containers on top of each other, just like you can stack levels of git commits on top of each other. So that's a very portable aspect of containers. Um, especially when you start thinking about scaling an application and when you have lots of different app servers, thinking about transporting only the deltas of these containers is very interesting because it helps with efficiency. You don't necessarily, for example, as opposed to VMs where you ship a literal entire VM around, which is several hundred megs, you can just ship deltas. So it's very similar like syncing your Git. The other way that uh, Docker is portable is that it offers the Docker Hub a website um, where it actually provides a lot, lot of different uh, base containers or other, other experiments people have done, very similar to GitHub. And what this does for portability is it gives a central repository to pull these containers from. Um, so wherever you have access to the internet and you have Docker, you have a place to pull uh, containers from, at least containers that are on the registry. So self-sufficient. Um, just like you can do crazy things with containers, um, you can actually do very, very cool things with uh, containers and Docker again as an example. Um, this is an example Docker file, and this actually automates the setup, and it, this is a manifest file, very similar to what you might see in a shipping container with the ingredients or the con contents of a shipping container. This has the ingredients of the container. Um, and this offers a programmatic input-output specification um, for the container itself. Um, so uh, this describes, uh, regardless of what is inside the container, it's, uh, we're content agnostic um, of, the, of the contents. We really only care sort of these steps and then the inputs and outputs that are specified. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the commands um, that are in this Docker file when we do a demo. But just keep this in mind that it's a way of automating these containers. So uh, the fourth characteristic is that these can be a uh, the third characteristic is that these can be uh, manipulated using standard operations. Um, so some examples of this, and, and again, this is done mainly using the Docker command line interface. Um, these can, containers can be started, stopped, copied, pulled, pushed. Um, all the same way. So whether you're starting up a container that runs Redis, My, MySQL, Apache, Nginx, they're all started and stopped the different, different, the same, they're all started and stopped the same way. And that's true regardless of operating system. So whether you're starting or stopping a service on CentOS, Ubuntu, CoreOS, uh, they all use the very same Docker run or Docker kill commands. Um, so that's, again, an important interface. The, uh, the second part behind this scene that's important here is that there's also a Docker daemon that's running, and that's what is actually sort of does the interactions. So you're, you have a command line interface to the Docker daemon, um, and that's sort of a hidden component that people don't necessarily know is running, but that is an important aspect. The, uh, the last sort of fourth component here is uh, do uh, containers run consistently across platforms. Um, and this is uh, interesting for a couple of reasons. And one of the key technology differences between uh, virtual machines and containers is that containers actually have in-kernel sandboxing. So there's a difference in kind of technologies that's powering these. So when people talk about, oh, why don't you just use a VM, or containers are the same thing as VMs, they're actually not. Um, so when we look at virtual machines on a hypervisor, there's actually um, software that's doing, in, uh, doing emulation of hardware to provide access 
to an entire uh, operating system from the ground up. Um, so when you look at a virtual machine that says, I'm Ubuntu running on X type of hardware, that, har that hardware that it thinks it's running on is actually uh, emulated by the underlying hypervisor. Containers are different. Um, they skip that hardware emulation and use the actual kernel of the host OS. So this has some limitations and some security implications that we'll talk about um, in a couple slides. But what is nice is that for now, Docker done, does run consistently across platforms. Um, and it offers this great advantage of much higher performance than virtual machines. And when we think about where we can use uh, containers, that sort of in-kernel sandboxing and its performance implications is a huge advantage. So here's the second analogy. Why do I keep hearing about Docker? Docker, 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 Docker. So very similar to how the iPod was not the first MP3 player, um, Docker was not the first container technology. It was probably the first container technology to get it right and wrap a lot of these core pieces and components together in a way in a, that had a user experience that was fantastic. And that was really an innovation. Everything from the registry online to the command line interface to some of the scripting and tools around the daemon uh, made Docker really easy to use. Um, so that was really one of the core reasons why Docker is taken off. Um, I want to just mention briefly so you're familiar with some of these keywords in case you haven't heard them, but things like AUFS is the append-only copy and write file system that gives us those deltas for containers. Uh, LXC is the actual uh, in-kernel sandboxing that Docker is using. Um, and there's some other things like uh, C group and namespacing in the Linux kernel that Docker makes use of. So if anyone ever mention, mentions these in reference to containers, um, those are some of the underlying technologies. So definitely the rest of this talk is about how to use Docker through different, different environments. So development, staging, production, testing. Um, so, so yeah, let's, let's just dive into it. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, two more caveats before, before we get there. Uh, uh, what is Docker not? This is not a container. Um, I do want to say, um, like I mentioned earlier, Docker is not a silver bullet. Um, we, we talked a little bit about some of the security stuff. Um, one of the reasons why you don't see uh, a lot of people using Docker in production, and you do see some examples, uh, why, you, why you haven't seen a lot of people moving um, to Docker exclusively um, across the public cloud is because of some of these worries about security. Um, other container te technologies might fix some of this. So we'll talk about using containers in production and some of the limitations there and some of the, some, the simple tooling that's lacking. Um, and I think there are other uh, technologies out there like AWS Elastic Beanstalk that does offer containerization. Um, haven't really seen large uptake. Um, but um, it is important to sort of pick and choose where you want to use these technologies. The historical um, example I want to give is uh, two, actually. So the JVM, Java, write once, run anywhere, uh, turned out to not be so true. And the same thing is true with virtualization. So if anyone here is familiar with virtualization, everything from VM VMware and its different virtualization formats to QCAL to LVM, um, all the, this sort of plethora of different formats that came out um, definitely offer a cautionary tale about how these exciting technologies can splinter. Um, so right now, uh, Docker definitely is the behemoth, um, but we are seeing other things pop up. And it's something to think about and sort of watch like as the community evolves um, to sort of see just, just what happens. Um, some other like, keywords, buzzwords that you might hear are things like Mesos, Kubernetes, CoreOS. Um, these are all different ways of actually running Docker um, and hosting Docker. Um, so I'm not going to talk about these too much, but just so, again, you know what they are and you have a background. Um, these are different ways you could run Docker basically in production. And there are different tools for that. OK, so 
where do we want to use Docker and why is it so cool? First case, let's talk about development. And, and hopefully we'll answer your question here. Why do we want to use Docker in development? Three sort of like quick examples. Um, you actually want to use the same environment, your, the same sort of setup across your environments. So you want to use the same sort of like Nginx, MySQL, Redis, whatever, or you know, your, your same production environment in development. Um, great example of doing that is having everything on one droplet. And when you put it into production, uh, you just want to use the same thing in development. And you actually want to replicate that across projects. And Docker is good at that because it lets you set up a base sort of uh, system that you can use and then replicate it lots and sort of add layers on top. So the classic example is, let's say like I have a server setup I know I want to use for you know, some, some Laravel project or like, like WordPress or something. I want to use, like, I want to use my Nginx configured this way with, with Nginx and then, and then a certain version of MySQL that I like. So we can do all that setup in one Docker file. And then for every project, layer on our project specific stuff on top of that. Um, and that sh sort of shared base can be replicated across different projects. And that gives you a sort of a quick head start. Um, a lot of people at this point then ask me why, well, why don't you just use like Chef or um, Ansible, which we just saw a demo for. Um, and I think they're similar. Um, it, oh, some of it is a question of what you're comfortable with. One difference is that using something like uh, Chef or Puppet is much more targeted towards production. Some people do try to use Chef and Puppet in development and running it against sort of like a virtual machine with Vagrant. Um, some people do have a lot of success with that. It's, it's oftentimes a lot harder and it's a lot more overhead than what Docker gives you. Um, sort of the way that you can sort of layer stuff on top and version that um, is very different than what Chef gives you or you know, any of these other sort of like configuration management tools. Um, without sort of the, the entire like versioning that you get with something like Docker. Um, so the, the, the second example is sort of complex um, multi-component systems. And th this happens much more when you're at scale. So this um, happens, I have a quick, so when, you're, when your system starts to look like this, um, developing on this can be quite a challenge. Like how do you replicate this on someone's laptop? And how do you replicate this not just on one, one person's laptop, but on the new person's laptop? Yeah, it's like, it's a pain. I don't know if you've ever had to go through this, but like making sure you have the right version of Redis with the right version of OS X, and you know, you have Xcode installed so you can compile something, or you know, maybe someone's running on, you have a Linux developer, and then how do you get the, you know, the right, the right header files, uh, it's, it's not fun. So um, Docker's cool, or containers uh, are cool, because they allow you to do stuff like extract this into their components, pull those together, and then actually successfully run those different containers or one container on someone's machine. And again, there is a much lower overhead because it's not virtualization that makes it feasible to run multiple things on like a laptop as opposed to running a full virtual machine. Um, I, you know, it, completely personal anecdote, um, I've had much more success without my processor you know, overheating and, and burning things um, because of the inherent um, uh, performance implications of containers. The, um, the third um, aspect where I actually think containers are very successful is they, they allow you to very quickly prototype things. And again, this is an advantage for development. So uh, if you want to try a different compiler for your PHP, what does that look like? Well, let's take the current Docker file I have or the current setup I have and swap out that one component. And then like, let's try it. Um, that again um, is an aspect that's fairly unique to Docker because it allows you to swap those things in and out, either in a Docker file for one system um, or, or in a multi-component system. Um, so at this point, um, I just want to pull up a console. 
and walk through some of these commands about what it might look like using Docker. This might be a little elementary for folks who had uh, Docker before. And my console does not want to come over. Yeah. There we go. Cool. All right, I'll we'll blow this up a little bit. Cool. So the first thing I want to do is I want to list my my uh, running uh, containers. Let's just take a look at what that looks like. OK, so I have a version of the Docker registry running. Um, what I actually want to do is I want to run some, I want to run something with PHP, since that's the mode of the month. Um, and let's just take a look at what, um, oops, what this Docker file does. So um, we're, gonna, we're actually going to build this container before we run it. Um, but uh, just glancing at it briefly, um, it looks like we do a bunch of setup. And this actually has all the components for a LAMP stack right on it. Um, and you can see some of the key commands here are when we go to build this, we actually run an apt get update inside the container. And so this starts out from Ubuntu 14.04, so Ubuntu Trusty, and then runs all these commands in the container. Um, some of the other commands you might see are things like add. Um, and this is actually taking files from the local uh, directory when you build this container and adds them to, con uh, copies them into the container. Um, the last sort of uh, key command that you might want to know is this expose <laughs> command. And this is the uh, beginnings of uh, the input output specification. And what's kind of interesting here is that. What we actually didn't do here is we didn't do any hardening. So the first thing you do when you hop on a virtual machine is you say, shut down everything. Don't talk to the world because I know I'm getting port scanned. I know someone's going to try you know, taking all the, trying me on port 22 for SSH access. So we're not doing that here because we don't need to. The only thing that we expose is port 80. Um, and that's that little command down here in the corner. If I can find my mouse, I'd highlight it. Ah. Okay. So. Uh, yes, it is handled by the host operating system. Um, and something to think about there is, uh, so so it still is a requirement on the host. Um, depending on your host, that may or may not be easier. So. Uh, I'm not going to talk about CoreOS, but this is a CoreOS box. And one of the advantages there is because it is a stripped down operating system, they're really, they've done a lot of that stuff for you by default. And they, they've basically taken out everything that could hurt you. OK, so uh, the other thing I want to do is actually list uh, the images I have. Um, and there's another sort of keyword that you need to know when you talk about Docker. There's a difference between Docker containers and then Docker images. And similar to in code where, you have, where um, objects are instances of classes, uh, and I always get this mixed up, containers are instances of images. So for example, you pull down an image from the Docker registry. So all, these are all the images that I have access to. When I actually run them and when I do something like Docker PS, um, I'm listing containers. So images on top, containers on bottom. So uh, let's um, error up so I make sure I get the right command. Um, I'm actually going to run this PHP container, and we're going to see what it looks like. Um, and this command broken down does a couple things. I'm saying docker run as a demonize, that's a dash D flag, and expose um, from port 80 inside the container. Uh, the external port 80, 
and that's actually listed. So the external port is first, and the internal external port is first, the internal port port is second, and then run my Tutum PHP uh, image as a container. So uh, we run that, and it's running. And if we go on the interwebs to that IP, oops, I was going to grab my IP. Hey, we're alive. And if we come back and kill that container, uh, we're not dead. So hello world and goodbye world um, with Docker. Um, and that also sort of introduces some of the, some of the first things you might need to know when you uh, work with Docker. Um, something else I just want to um, show really quickly is what happens when you build um, a, uh, when you build a container. Um, so this was me playing around with um, hack, whoops, a little earlier. Um, and so I already built this image. So this is this was really quick for a couple of reasons. Um, the first time I ran this, it took about five ten minutes to actually go through, pull down some of this stuff, and run all these commands. But what it did is it actually, when we rebuilt it, it looked and it compared the cached uh, images or values of the images um, to to what existed on my system. So the second time I ran this, it was very quick because it was just using those cached uh, images. Um, if we were to change some of our Docker file for this, um, we would, it would actually go through and rebuild all of this. And it would look a little different, as you would see it working through all the different steps. Um, again, sort of like when you use this in development, it's very cool because you, you can sort of test stuff out um, in isolation because of that diffing mechanism. So if you make a mistake, your container is always versioned, and you can always go back to a version. Just like Git offers tags, Docker offers tags, and you can sort of swap back and forth between different um, versions of your container. OK, so uh, the next uh, environment that often comes up, and I think this is, it sounds ironic, but this is actually my favorite environment to use Docker in. Um, we use Docker extensively, uh, inside our company at least, um, to do testing. And the reason is because it's hygienic, it's repeatable, it's performant, um, and it's been a huge leap forward for us. We also do have sp specific concerns. We do a lot of testing. Um, but Docker was different for us as opposed to running on something like Jenkins. I don't know how many people here have used Jenkins before. but. Uh, running sort of tests on the same box with access to the entire file system is very different than running something in a container where you basically throw everything away after you're done. Um, and again, that's a huge difference. Like running, running tests on a, on a file system where you've run previous tests and maybe you've you had something that touched the file system before and you didn't isolate yourself properly is very different than using sort of throwaway containers. Um, a great example of this is a uh, drone. Um, Travis has also now moved to using containers. Um, but if you ever want to spin up drone to do your test, would highly recommend it. I think it's great. Give it a try. So uh, next up is staging and production. I want to talk a little bit about sort of the promise uh, here, which is like idempotent deploys which is, again, the same thing. You throw away a container after you're done using it every time you deploy it to production. Um, uh, I think, just to sort of briefly summarize, I don't think we're quite there yet. There are some tools out there that you can pull down and use, stuff like Docker Compose, which was Fig. There's some other bunch of third-party stuff out there. I just don't think the tooling is there. Um, there are some third-party services out there that do do a lot with containers, and I think it's very exciting. I think it's much more important to sort of, and it's much more accessible to use Docker in development and testing uh, before you get into production. Maybe by this time next year, we'll see some great tools. I just don't know if we're there yet. 
So very, very quick on staging and production. That being said, if you do have specific concerns, like you want to like reuse, uh, stack a bunch of people on one droplet or virtual machine, for example, because they share underlying stuff and stuff doesn't get a lot of traffic, uh, Docker might be interesting because you can uh, plop them all together. And if you don't have concerns about uh, downtime during deploys, like if you you know if it doesn't matter if someone's down for a few seconds, um, then it's pretty easy to script something and swap in a container. Um, you can just do very simple deploy scripts with with shell scripting and just use the Docker CLI. So, thank you. yeah, yeah, yeah so, please. What I'm getting from you is more that so Docker is a development tool that's sort of mimicking the production environment. Is this is this true or is this something that actually go all the way to production? So it, it, it's, it's, it, I can kind of get a little bit back and forth on what you just said. It's, yeah. So I think it, so, so here's, I'll just give you my perspective. Okay. If you have the resources, Docker is amazing at every stage in the development life cycle. I think the tooling for production is not quite there yet. And because it is an open source product, you know, it moves at its own pace. So I think the tooling for deployment, orchestration, um, Needs needs a bit more love, and I would and like. I play around with like personally. I play around with Docker a lot. Um, you know, at DigitalOcean, we we don't have a lot of stuff in production just because of some of the tooling issues. And like we could surmount them. Um, you know, for, so for example, I know Gilt does a lot with Docker in production, and, and they do some of this very cool uh, deployment stuff. But they've also invested a lot of time in engineering uh, hours into getting it working. So uh, it sort of depends. You know, if you have some time to sink into figuring out a system that works for you and you know is trustworthy, um, I think it's great. Um, and you really can go all the way. Uh, again, it's sort of up to you. You touched on three tools that you said would solve for production. Could you touch on them again? Mesos, Kubernetes, and CoreOS? Sure. So I didn't say they fixed all the problems of production. I said there were ways of sort of hosting in production. And they all, again, offer different ways of, of getting to that step. Um, but again, you have some of the different tooling problems around them um, that don't necessarily solve those problems. Um, stuff like Mesos and Kubernetes is interesting because they, they look at containers a little differently. Um, and they, they attempt to take on some of the challenges of orchestration and tooling, but there's a lot more overhead for running those things. Um, and there's a lot. It, there's a much higher bar in terms of complexity for something like Mesos, where you literally have to run, you have to run not only your uh, servers that host your containers, you have to run orchestration uh, services around them. Yes, yes. So um, again, there's a trade-off, right? You get uh, different guarantees with that added layer of complexity, but there is another layer of complexity there. So if you do get to the point where your application is complex or you need a high, high enough level of uptime that, that those demands warrant that complexity, uh, then you should do it. But that's not always true. So it's all about, about trade-offs. So they figured out the security issues with Docker, meaning memory sharing and... So uh, most of the security issues... Yeah, most of the securities, security issues revolve around sort of like root access and, and escalation of escape. Basically, they're basically container escape vulnerabilities. So, you know, Docker patches stuff all the time as an example of a container. Um, and today there are no known uh, escape vulnerabilities in Docker. Is there any kind of, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's some performance aspects to running it in a production setting, right? Like if I have a, a production container, or uh, I'm sorry, an Apache container or something like that for my server, uh, wouldn't there be a little bit of a performance hit versus just running Apache in my host OS? You know, uh, pe people talk about this. Um, I, again, I, you know, I don't know the, the nitty gritty details. Um, my, my understanding is that I haven't done any serious benchmarking. I've seen some people argue both ways. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, you know, there, might, there probably is some uh, you know, you're running the Docker daemon. You're, you know, there is. It's not perfect, but, but again, because um, it, it's, it's really not that much. Right. It's, 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 it's pretty good. Yeah, there I are mean, very few applications where it matters. 
Well, I mean, I, I don't know. If you're running, I, I've always felt like if you're running in production, you're running at a large scale, then any performance hit is, you know, potentially costly. Um, but whereas with provisioning and, vir and virtual machines, you know, I can then just use the provisioning software to provision my uh, production servers um, so that way I know that they are provisioned the same as all of my other servers from test to development. Um, so I guess that, I guess the trade-off to me was always that Docker would be something that I would also have to run in production. Whereas it's, you know, if I'm doing provisioning, then I'm provisioning basically the same OS that everybody's been developing for years, you know, the same LAMP stack that everybody's been developing for years. So, you know, I already know the performance implications there. Yeah, I, I would say that you're you're really swapping out tools, right? So Docker does D Docker does have a little bit of a danger of like trying to be everything to everyone. So there are some provisioning aspects to Docker with that Docker file. Um, so for example, I don't know what you're provisioning with, but Chef or Puppet or Ansible maybe. But so you can still use things like Ansible, maybe Chef or Puppet to like orchestrate your containers. But you would you would actually do the configuration of the containers with Docker itself. Right. Um, and that's maybe a difference between the two systems. Right. You're, sort of, you're replacing some aspects of that. Cool. Thanks, folks. <laughs>